Hi, I'm Andy Murray. Welcome to It's a Customer's World podcast. Now more than ever, retailers and brands are accelerating their quest to be more customer-centric. But to be truly customer-centric, it requires both a shift in mindset and ways of working, not just in marketing, but in all parts of the organization. In this podcast series, I'll be talking with practitioners, thought leaders, and scholars to hear their thoughts on what it takes to be a leader in today's customer-centric world. In this episode, I have with me Jeff Swearingen. Jeff is currently the Senior Vice President of PepsiCo North America's Demand Accelerator. His team is responsible for horizontal demand acceleration across all of PepsiCo's North American businesses. He is accountable for creating long-term transformational impact in media, advanced analytics, shopper and retail insights, and short-term P&L impact through shopper marketing, category leadership, and retail space transformation. He's a 25-year veteran of PepsiCo, having joined the company in 1994. During my talk with Jeff, we discussed the vast skills required in customer experience space, such as flexibility, patience, and passion for delighting customers. We also discuss how employee experience translates into customer experience and the importance of understanding the deep-rooted humanity of consumers rather than focusing too much on the transactional aspect of customer business relationship. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to It's a Customer's World podcast. It's great to have you here. My pleasure, Andy. I'm glad to join you and looking forward to it. You're one of the few road warriors, uh, journeymen that's been in this space for quite a while, uh, like me. So it's nice to see you're uh, thriving and and continuing at it. Uh, You've been really working in the coal face of what we call shopper marketing or customer experience for years. Take me to that moment when you first got excited about this space and its potential to drive growth. Yeah, I think one of the things that's been an advantage for me is I grew up at PepsiCo and in in North America, so much of our business is direct store delivery, which gives us the opportunity to really curate the experience at retail for our customers. Um, So as a marketer early in my career, that was very exciting. It's like another tool in the toolkit where you can come up with great advertising, great packaging, great product, but also the ability to pull that all the way through to retail and to try to at least hold on to the beauty of that idea or even enhance that idea in a retail environment um, was always interesting to me. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think it started as a brand marketer, seeing that as an opportunity and then grew from there. Well, well, I think you've picked a good field, especially today, because it seems like this space of customer experience is continuing to emerge and probably even more so now than ever before uh, in terms of just the importance to the company. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was the the brand marketer background, which is, is uh, great and it's a great grounding, but this area does bring new skills. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what new skills or mindsets will companies need to adapt in order to be successful at building a more customer-centric organization? Uh, Yeah, it's a great question. Let me start with mindset. Um, One of the things that I think is important is I think you have to be intrinsically motivated by delighting customers. And And I choose that word specifically, delighting customers, not satisfying customers, not, you know, doing a pretty good job with customers, but delighting them. And I think the companies that are great in this space, you see it. You see it in their employees. You see it in the way they come to market every day because they genuinely take pride in it. At PepsiCo, we call it creating smiles. Mm. And one of the things that we're very driven by is creating more and more smiles or making customers happy um, every day. So Mindset, I think, is important in terms of you know broader skill sets. Um, I think you have to have empathy. I think you have to have this an, an infectious enthusiasm uh, for the space. Uh, probably some patience and perseverance uh, as mm-hmm. well, um, and flexibility because uh, you're connecting a lot of things and creating customer experience. And it's not going to be perfect every time, but um, but you can improve over time. 
Um, and then I think I would say in terms of specific skill sets, more and more being able to connect the art to mm. science is important. Um, you know, there's a couple of statistics that we throw around a lot. You know, one of them is 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. Uh, and another one is 1.7 megabytes of data are created every second for every person on earth. So oh that amount of data and the analytical ability to harness that data is fairly new, particularly mm -hmm. in our space. And so if you take the power of that to understand the behavior of customers um, and to marry that with a deep understanding of what you need to make, uniquely motivates them, I think it's a, it's a great marriage. Um, I think we've always been pretty good at the art of it, and there's always been good mm -hmm. examples of the art of it. But I think the big change now is is adding science. And then I just think having a a service culture um, mm -hmm. that under underlies it, you know, companies like Chick-fil-A are just amazing at just this yeah. service culture. So th those are things that come to mind in terms of skills. Yeah. Your background is interesting because you've come from a traditional, traditionally trained brand marketer, uh, and there are some that get into this space from a sales background, a promotion background. Uh, how has that background served you well in being successful in this space? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think it starts with just the empathy for consumers and uh, trying to make the consumer the center of all your planning and all your decisions. And at the end of the day, you know, we're working to create what we call three audience winners in our programming that starts with the consumer. Uh, next is the retailer in our case. And then the third uh, in that order is, is our company, but it starts with mm -hmm. consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, I also just think that there's a, um, there's a desire to dig pretty deep to understand the whys behind the what's. Um, yeah. Often we'll take the what we see or experience, the behavior that we see, and we'll build plans on that. Just the consumer training is really digging into what's the unique motivation behind that. What's the yeah. root cause of that? Yeah. Um, and I, I'd like to Andy, I just as a kind of a throwaway, I just think you yeah. build this muscle around observation. Yeah. That. Um, just never goes away. And you just find yourself, regardless of the role that you're in, just being keenly observant and trying to stitch together things that are going to, to deliver against that three audience winner objective. Yeah, well, that's that's a great point. And, you know, so many times I um, hear people talk about, you know, the power of customer data, which is totally, totally true. And it, it can provide a lot of insight, but sometimes there's no substitute for, in-store, observational, uh, talking, get it in home. If you're talking about consumer, uh, just the insights you get on that, which you get trained as a brand marketer to do, uh, just never leaves you as a real powerful skill. Yeah, it's funny. We spend a lot of time now talking about the science behind uh, digital advertising, and there's great, great science mm -hmm. behind it. Um, but we really try to balance that with the empathy and depth of understanding of, of the consumer. Uh, and so that's a journey. But I think uh, if you can get both of those right, if you can get the science and the art right, and you can approach it with that service mindset of of mm. delighting the consumer, you have a pretty good chance of being successful. Yeah, great, great point. One of the things I see uh, also a lot is companies using the customer experience space to solve dissatisfiers in order of a priority as working through the hassle factors, which makes a lot of sense. It's the low hanging fruit. You can tell the customers are irritated and it's something to, to work on eliminating, but far fewer are totally engaged in trying to create new customer experiences for several reasons. The dynamic nature of the customer, their expectations are always changing. It takes some risk. You're jumping into some uncertainty. Um, how, how do you approach trying to find or unlocking new experiences that may not be an issue related to dissatisfiers, but trying to take take the company forward into the new spaces? Yeah, it's a good question. I think dissatisfiers are alluring because they promise a quick win. That's right. And uh, in that sense, I think eliminating, dis eliminating dissatisfiers is very important work. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can be what I would call 
order winning work. It can actually drive loyalty and it can drive um, conversion. Sure. Uh, but you have to ask yourself if eliminating dissatisfiers alone is going to, I'll go back to this word, is it going to create delight yeah. or is it going to create crazy, irrational loyalty? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's not, then you have to go beyond that. And, you know, if you think it's difficult to understand uh, the future, particularly these days, it's crazy mm -hmm. hard to predict the future. But I'll give you a few thoughts um, in terms of trying to understand satisfiers or delighters um, as yeah. we as we move forward. And they're they're not there's nothing magical about them, but they're pretty important. I think the first is it goes back to the consumer marketing question. Just be crazy curious. Yeah. Crazy curious, be observant, listen, be willing to experiment, which is harder than you might think, uh, be willing to experiment. Um, the second I would say is uh, be nonlinear. Um, I think eliminating dissatisfiers is a fairly linear journey. Yeah. Um, be nonlinear. What I mean by that is look in unusual places, look in different industries, look globally, look at startups, look at what venture capital companies are doing, look in unusual places, non-linear places for seeds uh, mm -hmm. of ideas that could help drive great satisfaction and delight with your mm -hmm. customer. Um, one of the things I like to do is lean on what I call personal board of directors. And it's just surround yourself with a group of people that will challenge your thinking and they'll do it from a variety of different perspectives they'll advise you and they'll do it from a variety of different backgrounds skill sets experiences um and they will they will speak truth um to you and i think that can be helpful. and then i i would say the other uh, thing that comes to mind is i think in the context of all that you have to pace change according to your industry some mm -hmm. industries can move very quickly to address satisfiers. Some it's more challenging. If you're mm. an industry that has a big asset base that you're working against, it's harder to be yeah. as nimble. So um, you'd have to look away at ways to pace change, but um, but those are things that come to mind. I love this idea of personal board of directors. Is that uh, a concept that anybody could adapt in their career? Or is that something for more senior leaders? How would you go about that personal board of directors? Great idea. Yeah, I think anyone can do it. I think, you know, it's it's not a it's a very close cousin to just having mentors. Mentor, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I think it's a little bit more intentional mm -hmm. than just having mentors. It's choosing a group of people that have different backgrounds, different experiences, work in different industries and be intentional about how mm -hmm. you reach out to them to get their feedback. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, um uh, one of the things that I have found to be a, a, a very effective hack um, mm -hmm. in my life and in my career is when you have this group of people and you can craft a very clear question Yes, and you can just send that very clear question out to them, it's amazing how close you can get to a well-honed point of view on a topic, yes. literally in a matter of a few hours. Yeah, um, because you're just you're 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 standing on the shoulders of giants with yeah. great diversity in their experience. So, yeah, I find it to be super super helpful. That that's a that's a great piece of advice. I love that idea of the singleness of it. You know, sometimes I I suggest when I'm in a mentoring relationship with someone is asking them what's the single biggest outcome you're after in this particular situation. Have you written that down? And a lot of times they haven't really thought about the outcome they're actually trying to get and they can describe the problem, but not necessarily the outcome. And your point about getting that down to a simple question that's clear and compelling, it, it unlocks a lot of things. Yeah. I, I think take a very deductive approach um, yeah. sometimes or reverse engineer. Um, these now things. when you find these new experiences and it's something you're going to go after, one of the challenges I see in industry and business today is those are probably not going to have precedent in terms of ROI and getting that business case put together to sell through the CFO and the finance can, unless you've got a culture that accepts that in that trial and error st stage, it's, it sometimes can be difficult to put a business case together on something that's not been 
proven yet. Uh, I can certainly, if I'm asking for tech resources uh, and I'm competing against the e-commerce guys that can absolutely tell you the value of moving that shopping button here or there versus me saying, but this can improve queue times. And well, what does that mean for the business? And what's the ROI? Um, that ends up being a bit of a barrier. And um, have you had any luck in trying to advance the puck in that particular direction? Yeah, I would. Um, there's there's a few things that come to mind. Uh, let me start by saying there are definitely things that we're going to do where the ROI is unclear. Yeah. Um, that said, my challenge to our team at all times is you have to think like a general manager. Yeah. So I want you to go into every idea and I'm going to press you to show me where this is going to land on the P&L. Yeah. And I please know that we can debate these things and we may not sort it out right here, but I'm going to, I'm going to push yeah. you for that. And I think really just pressing for that sometimes will allow you to narrow the goalposts enough yeah. that you will get a business proposition that has clarity of uh, clarity, first and foremost, around what problem you're solving, what business problem you're solving, mm -hmm. clarity around the barriers that exist mm -hmm. today that are creating that. Then clarity around the work that needs to be done to uncover the insights or the analytics that can address those barriers. And then an idea of the economic value if we're successful in, in, in achieving that. And again, I think it's about, you know, use that the metaphor about narrowing the goalposts. You may not yeah. be able to, to perfectly identify exactly what it's going to be worth, but if you can provide a range, then you can usually, I think of our team. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're constantly going to internal venture capital firms, That's right, internal yeah. venture. So I'm constantly going and pitching for funding. Yeah. And I have to think of that, like I'm a startup and I'm going to a VC and I'm pitching for funding and they need to have enough faith that you've thought through the business plan. There's line of sight to growth and profitability, um, that they'll fund you. And I think if you take that approach versus what often happens in big companies is we just have this assumption there's an entitlement that we're going to get funding for things. <laughs> yeah. There's no entitlement. No, Go no. Earn, earn your money. Well, what you've done a, a really nice job of articulating is a systematic approach to thinking about this is a problem you're always going to get. You're not going to walk away from it. So face into it, build yourself an approach, the VC model and realize you're always gonna be pitching. That's just part of it. Now, one thing that I think the pure place have as an advantage sometimes is they have the digital touch points all the way there. So they might be able to make a case around lifetime value and using that metric to evaluate versus return on investment. And most of us traditional brands and brick and mortar still use ROI as a, as a litmus test and haven't yet really evolved to quantify business cases based on lifetime value. And so maybe that's a place we'll get to somewhere in the future. A, a middle ground that we will use sometimes, and sometimes we'll do this with really good math, and sometimes we'll do this a little more conceptually, but we'll use the concept of net present value. Ah. And um, it, it may not be a lifetime value, but it's also not immediate. So to g give me a three-year net present value on this initiative and you know, sh show me a path Yep. to growth and profitability over a reasonable horizon. So there's different ways that you can you can frame it. Um, mm. And I found that if you can, but I've all, I have found that if you can find some financial language yes. that in a bigger company like ours, that is, you know, common currency internally, it just helps um, because it's the way people are accustomed to approving things. So being able to bridge from that startup mentality to some financial language that's common in your organization is helpful. I, I couldn't agree more. And when I went to ASTA, one of the first things I did was um, contact the Ehrenberg Bass Institute and looked at the Byron Sharp work because it provided a financial conversation framework that I could sit down with finance and, the, and then look at our media spends and our in-store and all that and start to be able to put it into a financial language that allowed me to get more progress and create more confidence. And uh, you, that was really, really helpful. Unfortunately, the customer experience in its in the totality 
doesn't yet have that research underneath it and the modeling to say, this tends to do this, and we've got 10,000 case studies that prove it. I, th I think that's something that will come over time, uh, but it, it does help. And I, you can't really walk away from our responsibility to talk in business language uh, because you're fighting against all kinds of opportunities, rightly so. So I, I love the fact you've taken it on so thoughtfully, uh, as, and it helps everybody become a, a smarter business person and not just a pure marketer. It may be top of mind for me, Andy, because I sat through a meeting just like this yesterday. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, yes, I, I can relate. Trust me, I've, I've been there many times. I can totally relate. Uh, one of the questions I had for you, too, uh, is that I think – you know, when people start saying, well, we want to become a customer-centric organization, and where do we start, or how do we get on that journey even faster, there is a school of thought that says you should start with the employee experience. And the employee experience is tightly married to that customer experience. And is your experience, you kind of alluded to, it probably is very, very close, um, very, very important, but um, how does your work get connected back to employee experience? That's a great question. Um, I think the employee experience can be an accelerator or a decelerator. Mm. And I think you can be very purposeful in breaking it down and understanding how you can engage your employees in a way to, for, so that they're an accelerator to the journey for your customer. And it's funny because you can spot organizations that do this well. Mm. And uh, there's a there are a few telltale signs. One is you see the enthusiasm of yeah. their employees. You see the, the authenticity um, of their employees. Uh, mm -hmm. And you see consistency yeah. uh, from their employees at different touch points yeah. um, as well, and consistency over time. And you know, what, use a few examples. Ritz Carlton's a great example. Um, which I mentioned earlier, Chick-fil-A in a completely different industry yeah. is a good example. Sephora is a good example. Zappos is a good example. Um, there are many of them um, in, in many different industries, but they have these telltale signs that, that are common. And when you think about that experience, this is a, a little bit off the question, but when you think about, just take Ritz-Carlton, when you think about that experience, it literally starts from the moment that you pull up to the hotel. And yeah. You, the first person that greets you mm -hmm. and then how do they pass you to the next person and how do they pass you to the next person and just the consistency um, and engagement, it makes all the difference in the world. And uh, I, I think it, there's all these downstream benefits too around retention and just there's a lot of internal benefits to that as well. I, I'm wondering in that example in hospitality, they tend to talk a language that's different than what we do in CPG and retail sometimes uh, because guest. Uh, guest puts you into a human place where perhaps when we say cu the customer by definition is a transactional description of what what's going on. And I, I've always thought that perhaps not I've more recently been thinking about this word customer centric. It's a bit of an oxymoron. It, it's a bit more about human centric. And if you start from a humanity, these are people, then your associates or colleagues are people and the customer is people. But I think your mind opens up when you don't call it customer and define that relationship as a transaction. I love, love that. And I love the humanity of it. In fact, we have a, a few folks internally that will constantly correct us when we're in meetings. And even when we use the term consumer, <laughs> um, they will they will remind us that these are people. You know, yeah. this is this is your uncle, this is your aunt, yeah. this is your cousin, these are people. Yeah. And it is so funny, Andy, but so true that changing one word yes. shifts the paradigm. And yes. we, it now opens up an entirely new range of thoughts around how I would treat them. Yes. Uh, you know, and when I think of, you know, it, again, if I go back to Ritz Carlton and you think about their credo, which is around trust and honesty and integrity and respect and yeah. so very human qualities. Yeah. These are the qualities yeah. that you would treat your family, your neighbors, your friends. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important. Uh, yes. I do think it's important. Yes, I, I do think our, your mind shifts a bit when you start thinking about people versus customers. Uh, and it's bizarre that we've gotten to this 
far with all the marketing abilities and science and art to still think in customer. But I think people just don't think about it enough that it is a human thing. Um, so I have the privilege of working with the Walton College of Business and the uh, always proactive professor, Molly Raper. And she uh, is in the marketing department and heard that I was going to speak with you. And so she uh, very diligently pulled together some questions from students that uh, I've had a chance to listen to. Uh, I thought they're very thoughtful questions, relevant, and I'd like for them to, to play those if you're up for taking some student questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Excellent. Well, the first one is from uh, Megan, uh, Megan Lafferty, and she is a, her major is in international marketing. So let's first uh, hear Megan. I'm sure you've seen many changes over the last few months in operations and marketing due to COVID. So how do you think COVID will permanently affect operations and marketing efforts in the future? And then given these changes, how should students be adapting now to prepare for this new future? Well, let's just start off with the easy ones, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, no, it's great. It's a great question. Here's what, uh, obviously, uh, we're all adapting. Uh, to this environment. And that adaptation in our organization moves all the way from insights through marketing, manufacturing, sales, go to market and service. It's every part of our business. Here are the wonderful things. Um, the silver lining, I think that's coming out of this. It's forcing us to find new ways of working. It's forcing us to be agile. It's forcing us to um, try things we wouldn't have otherwise tried. And as a result of that, we're, bu we're building new skills. And those skills, without getting into a great deal of detail, they range from better understanding consumers and the unique motivation, what's the empathy of what's really going on in their life, whether it's a struggle mm -hmm. that they're going through or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or something that the more we understand them, the better that we can serve them. Uh, again, as humans, yeah. uh, our customers, having empathy for our customers and how we can be a better supplier partner to our customers. Our frontline organization, in the case of PepsiCo, we have a huge frontline organization that's working in retail every day. How do we better understand their challenges and better enable them to do their job in a range of circumstances? And then I would say just technology, even the way that we're doing this podcast today, we've become in a, in a matter of six months, we've become an organization that's much more adept at leveraging technology in every part of our business. And that should carry forward. So, you know, one of the things that I think is, is always um, a nice benefit of going through a difficult time is difficult times are often the genesis of innovation. And when we go through these, we have to adapt to survive and we have to innovate to survive. And we do things we wouldn't have otherwise done. And I think that's the case here. And I think we'll carry those things forward. And in literally the span of a year, we will be much better as an organization and much better as leaders than we would have been had we not gone through this together. Yes, 100%. And Jeff, I don't know if it's true where you work, but but one of the things I've seen happen is uh, before COVID, the corporate senior teams might have eight to 10 objectives that all felt essential. They was essential to everybody at the time. But the culling of that down because of the, what we've gone through in this crisis has seemingly, seemingly unleashed a lot more energy in the organization by having fewer objectives. And uh, I did a LinkedIn poll on how many people would love to see us go back to the multi objectives versus staying singularly focused post covid it was 100% let's 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 just keep it to a fewer because it unleashes so much more focus and capacity um, i think there's something about that idea of focus that helps people i agree i think there's focus i think the frequency of communication yeah as well we because of what we've gone through we've had to communicate weekly yeah. Um, because just the make, move, sell nature of the business requires that we be more nimble than we've probably ever been. Yep. And so our ability as a leadership team, globally, in fact, to connect very frequently 
to focus on those few things that are the most important and to ensure that we're removing barriers and enabling the people that make, move, and sell our product. Mm. Um, I, I just don't know that we would have approached it in the same way. And so mm. no. it's it's actually that part of it. Uh, obviously, as many bad parts of it, that part of it is is beneficial. Yeah, and let's hope it sticks. This next one is from Emily Pavrosnik. Uh, she is a major in marketing, and from her question, it sounds like she might actually have been your neighbor at one time. So let's uh, take a listen. Hi, Jeff. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your favorite role that you have done at PepsiCo and what your favorite part of working for them is. I'm also from McKinney, and I've heard great things about the company, so I would just love to hear even more from someone that has the experience like you do. Thank you. Your chance for a plug. Yeah, well, go McKinney, right? <laughs> um, and uh, also, I would say I'm glad you've heard many great things about PepsiCo. That's exciting to hear. Yeah, I, listen, I've been at PepsiCo 26 years. So I've been here a while, and I've had the opportunity to have you know some terrific roles. The one I'm in right now, I'll come back to it in 10 seconds and mm. tell you a little bit about this. But the one I'm in right now is probably my favorite role. I have a couple that I've really enjoyed. But what I will tell you, the characteristics of the role are maybe more important than the role. Um, I love roles that within a big company and the resourcing of a big company have a very entrepreneurial component to them. I love roles that have um, an element of transformation. I love roles that require uh, agility and that require bringing teams together to, to drive against common goals and overcome difficult challenges. And so throughout my career, I've often held up my hand and volunteered for what some would say were the unattractive jobs, um, because it wasn't always working on the biggest brand with the biggest budget. Sometimes it was working on the business with the most interesting challenge. And I've just always found those to be more rewarding. This current role I love because I sit in the middle of sales and marketing and insights at a global level. So what that means is I get to invite myself into marketing, sales, and insights meetings um, and agendas. And I get to find ways that uniquely bring those teams together so that we're working in concert against common opportunities. And we're leveraging the best thinking and capability that we have on a global basis to solve big problems um, or to chase big opportunities. And so to me, that's incredibly exciting. I always joke with people that you know, four days out of five are amazing. Mm -hmm. When you're in a role like this, one day out of five is a real train wreck. And so you just <laughs> plan for that uh, when you're in a role like this. But I, I love this role for that reason. Yeah, I, I've watched your career for a, a long time. I think we've known each other for over 20 years, and you do seem to take those places, I would call them roles that were out away from the center, and it's probably because the innovation you can do there when not everybody's watching you in the center. And it's just a marvelous way to think about your career planning and trajectory is sometimes those non-traditional roles outside from the center gives you enormous freedom to be inventive. Yeah, I think, Andy, the last three or four roles that I've had didn't exist before I had them. Wow. So to be able to create um, roles within a company like this and to have the amazing resources that we have, but to be able to work in a very entrepreneurial way to hopefully drive transformation that enables us to be successful for many years in the future is fun. Outstanding. Here's another question. Uh, it's from Gabby Byrne. She's a marketing major. Uh, this is a question that uh, your boss, your boss might also like to hear the answer to. Uh, so let's uh, listen to Gabby. How have you and your team maintained stable demand across PepsiCo's portfolio through the pandemic? Yeah, again, a good question. Um, look, we're <laughs> we're very, in some ways, we're very fortunate um, because our industry is. You know, it's not as much of a staple as milk and bread, but it's kind of a staple industry. We're in convenient food and beverage. And so even through the pandemic, there's been pretty consistent demand for our products. Now, that's we've seen shifts um, to, you know, maybe more in grocery stores or mass mm -hmm. stores or club stores and less uh, during periods of times in other parts of the business, but pretty consistent 
demand. Um, what I will tell you that's really interesting is, is, again, goes back to agility, having the agility to understand the week to week shifts in demand and to be able to make changes in the organization to meet that demand and to try to do it in a way where you, again, are delighting consumers, humans, um, when they when they buy your product is, you know, that's been the part that I think has been challenging. Uh, and it's also been fun. Um, again, it's been a fun, that's been a fun journey as well. But but you know, I have to be honest that part of part of the benefit for us is that we've just been fortunate to be in a really, we're fortunate to be in a in a great industry that is fairly fairly resilient. You know, what's going to be interesting, Jeff, and you and I have talked about this before, is that the uh, the focusing of SKUs in order to get to meet that demand because it was a it, it, the the situation was a bit of a tailwind for you in demand, fortunately. But that calling out, I think that there will be a question what happens for many companies uh, is, and some are predicting this golden age of creativity that's going to be in front of us in at some point when this is behind us, where we're going to have to rethink what is new and what is, you know, how to regain that shelf space and think about things that really offer value. Uh, this, this moment's allowed us to reassess all of that in a fresh way that probably wouldn't have done before. And it, it does, you do wonder, are we going to have that, that discretionary bandwidth? Cause we've been really good at optimizing and scaling efficiency, but what about scaling creativity? That's a harder one to scale. And you got to have a little bit more mental bandwidth to have that thinking time to do that. But do you think that we're going to see a demand for creativity post COVID that's going to be a bit higher than we've ever seen before? It's interesting. This is, this is pre COVID, but, um, but I think it's, it's relevant. So I, I was, I have a senior in high school, so we're in that planning for college phase and uh, Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks oh, yeah. a year or so ago, um, someone asked him, what advice would you give to, to students? Uh, and he, his emphasis was all on creativity. And uh, I, I think that creativity is going to be incredibly important. And creativity, often when we use the word creativity, again, it's a, it's a bit of an empty vessel word that you have to fill with meaning because it may take people to art or right. creative art or things like that. And it certainly is those things, but it's just agile problem solving. Yeah, and th that ability, that agile problem solving, is at a huge premium, and I think that will continue. Mm. And I think some of the functional capabilities and technical capabilities, because of machine learning and because of AI, a lot of those things will become a little more commoditized over time. Mm -hmm. And you'll have access to tools and, and capabilities that are at your fingertips that are going to be very powerful and very value added. But the real premium on you as a leader is your creativity and how you leverage those resources to solve big problems um, or to gain advantage in the market. So yeah, completely agree. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's great. Well, you spoke about the word leadership. The next two really get at the heart of leadership. And so I'd like to have you listen to Claire Carnes. She's a marketing major uh, and has a great question about leadership. Hi, Jeff. I was wondering how you personally measure and define success and if that has changed at all from growing up to OU Business School to the current role you're in at Pepsi. It's a great question. There's again, success is one of those words that you can take in a lot of a lot of directions. I I will tell you that for me, on to be completely transparent, I've probably defined success in different ways throughout my life. Yeah. Uh, I think as you go through your career, you go through seasons, and I think as you go through those seasons, what success means to you probably changes a little bit through those seasons, and and it it intertwines with your life and the things that are going on with your life at the time. But I would tell you that doesn't change our core values to me. Core values mm -hmm. don't change. The two or three things that are the most important to you at the beginning of your career journey, hopefully will be near the top at the end of your career journey. So for me, yes, I've had seasons of what success meant from a career and that has changed over time. Um, 
what's never changed for me is the idea of what success means for me personally. Mm. And that's honestly never been about career success for me personally has been about learning and contributing and growing and enabling others. Mm. And honestly, when I feel the most successful, when I feel the most successful is when I've done some small thing that has helped somebody else have a breakthrough. Mm. And when you see their eyes become bright and you see this, look on their face and you know that a door's just been opened and they're forever changed. That's huge. That to me yeah. is, I mean, I get chills now. I mean, yeah. you're probably, <laughs> yeah. your audience yeah. will probably laugh, but when yeah. I even say that now, it gives me goosebumps because yeah. there's nothing to me that's more aligned with what success means to me than, mm-hmm. than that. And whether it's somebody I work with, whether it's my kids, whether it's my spouse, uh, that's it. You, 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 you know, Jeff, that you, no matter how much you appreciate relationships and as one of those core values, when you enter into the workforce in your career, it just gets exponentially more important. You realize how more important that is the later you go and the more senior you get and you start looking back and, and that. And so, uh, I, I'm like you, the, the, I, I don't, I don't think I ever undervalued it, but I don't think I've ever appreciated it more on the importance of relationships and in networks and taking care of those networks and relationships. Cause I think even, even when you retire and I retire eventually, um, we'll still have a relationship. We'll still have, and, and I think that's the one thing that will outlive your legacies of what you actually do will be the relationships you've been able to build over these long periods of time. I completely agree. Uh, there's a, um, the last couple of roles that I've had to be completely honest, I don't think would have, I don't think I could have been successful if not for the 20 something years before that of having built relationships around our company and hopefully over that period of time built trust um, in those relationships, because there's no doubt in the last couple of roles, Andy, I've asked people to do things. I've asked people to come out on limbs with me. Yeah. And uh, you know, when you ask people to come out on limbs with you, one, you you need to have something in the bank that gives them confidence that you're mm. you have the capability and the commitment to what you're asking for, um, and y- you know they need to believe that you're going to do everything you can to be successful. Mm. So uh, it's it's just it's incredibly important. You, you remember that, and and I think it's so important. I, I go back to when uh, people don't know this, but I'll just share it anyway. I mean, you were one of my first clients, uh, and Charlie Anderson and I and. Uh, we called on you when you were free to lay. And uh, it was just a, a style, a graciousness, um, a tough but respectful. Uh, there was an approach you took to dealing with people that uh, it left an impact on me uh, ever since. And I know um, I, I was talking to Charlie the other day, so I'm getting ready to talk to Jeff. Do you want me to say hi? And he saw I just talked to him. And it's like, <laughs> how is that possible? You've, you've been managing these relationships for so long. Uh, you really do uh, stand up to that pro- your personal promise. You, you do that really, really well. And I just want to thank you for that. No, it's my pleasure. And you know, it's funny. I don't know that I could do it any other way. I don't do it for any reason. No. Um, it's just... You know, it's just, I think it's, I think it's enjoyable, actually. It's, <laughs> it's actually fun. Win, it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually fun to, you know, get to yeah. know people and, uh, yeah. you know, we share a lot of our lives together. So, yeah. Well, this here, the last question is from Addison Kathy, and she's got another brilliant question, I think, about leadership. In your TED Talk, Father Fisherman, you talk about your true north and how it helps you towards achieving happiness. In your job, how do you balance working and achieving while still following your true north? Do you feel as if this gives you a competitive edge in business? Uh, I'll start at the back. I absolutely think it gives you a competitive edge because if you're following your true north, you, four days out of five, love what you're doing. (laughs) Um, And you love the people that you get to do it with. And there's no doubt um, that that creates an advantage. And when you can create that environment for a broader team, that that advantage multiplies. Um, So absolutely, you know, I I think it's super important to spend the time and to understand what your true north is because you will go through 
many seasons of life and business, and it is very easy to lose your way, very easy to lose your way. Um, but if you take the time to really understand the end of the day, if everything goes south, here's what's most important to me. Hmm. And you commit to that, uh, then it doesn't matter what you're going through. The hmm. day-to-day tactical decisions that you make are going to be made within the context of what you know is important to you in your broader life. Hmm. And uh, so I think that's important. Um, the other thing that I will tell you that's uh, really important, I think, if you can if you can think about this early on, is um, S- Sir Ken uh, Robinson, I believe, has the, I think it's the most watched TED Talk uh, of all time. And uh, he also has a few books. Um, and one of the books I'm listening to right now, it's a few years old, it's called The Element. Um, and in the element, uh, one of the things he talks about is this intersection of what you're great at, your gift, what gifts you have, your competencies, what you're passionate about, what you love, what you would do for free, the mm. things that make your eyes bright, the things mm. that make your heart race, the things that make you sit up straight in your chair and become animated and start using your hands. Um, and then what tribe you're a part of. And it, it, what people you associate with, the environment that you're in, um, if you can get a good sense of these are the things I'm good at, these are the things that light me up, and this is an environment that brings out the best in me, then you have a really good chance to do great things, stay true to yourself, and have a lot of fun um, at the same time. So those things aren't always easy to line up, but they're simple concepts. And I f- I stray from them all the time, but I think sometimes just having them, just putting them on a sticky and putting them on your computer and reminding yourself of those things builds muscle memory where over time you just become better at understanding how to create an environment where all three of those things can work together. Well said. That's brilliant advice. And I also think what you do well, and it's the call to leadership as we get more senior, is to make that true for others. Is to, you know, I always love to be doing meaningful work, but if I can create meaningful work for someone else, then all of a sudden I'm in a new space of, of leadership. And so it's a never ending journey. And it's a great start there, build that into yourself. But then how can you make that true for other people? That's that moment of joy when someone lights up and sees something. Interesting. You know, the great quote, the Wright brothers said, um, we couldn't wait to get up in the morning. Uh, And boy, isn't that isn't work fun when at least four out of five of those days, Mm -hmm. you can't wait to get up in the morning. I will. um, One of my favorite quotes when I think about engaging teams. um, so, So much of what we do can be tactical day to day blocking and tackling. I never want to lose sight of the fact that, and this is the the Mm. paraphrase of the quote, um, if you want people to build ships, you don't send them out to gather wood. If you want them to build ships, you teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. Mm. And if people have this longing for the immensity of the sea, they'll figure out how to conquer the sea. 100%. And they'll bring creativity to that agenda that you would have never been able to bring. No. Um, on your own. So, look, we do a fair amount of wood gathering, yeah. for sure, but but we try in the midst of that to bring out this longing for yeah. the immensity of the task. You know, your your idea of big quest, yeah. the immensity yeah. of the quest, right? Yeah. Um, that's the thing that is the difference to me between really good and great. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's amazing. You almost made me forget my last question. I got so excited. Um, so so, so I, here's my last question. A lot of the uh, audience you're going to be speaking with through this podcast will be students in their maybe senior year. They're going to be thinking about the future uh, in May and graduating. What, what would you say to them that gives you hope about as you look out of what's in front of them? What would give you hope? Well, I have a lot of hope. And you know, it's funny because there are a lot of things that um, 
could undermine hope these days. Yes. Uh, you don't have to look far. Right. But hope isn't from hope doesn't come from the world. Mm. Hope hope has to come from within you. Yeah. And this optimism and belief in yourself, belief in humanity and the ability to move forward and make dif great differences in the world. And I'm incredibly excited. I have an, uh, almost a 18 and 16 year olds. And so this is very relevant for me because yeah. I spend a lot of time now thinking about what is their life going to be like. And I think sure. that for that generation, there's this amazing, amazing opportunities. I think we're at the precipice of change in so many areas that you have the ability to fundamentally change and in a positive way, uh, not only the way we do business, but the way that we the way that we live, the way that we govern, the way that we engage with one another. And, um, you know, so whenever I talk to people about this, I feel very hopeful. And uh, I think it's just, I think it's important just to have that, have that optimism. Ch try very much to live that Wright Brothers idea. Hmm. And uh, you're going to face challenges um, every day and you're going to face setbacks. And those are all moments of decision. Mm -hmm. And Every time you face something like that, it's just a choice point. Mm -hmm. It's a choice point. And you, the choice of what you do in that moment is 100% yours. Yeah. Am I going to, you know, look at this in a negative light or am I going to look at this through the lens of it's a happy accident? Yeah. And, you know, we're going to learn from this. We'll be better because of this. And so I feel great about it. And, uh, and I, I look forward to watching it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I have so many thoughts about how life is a mosaic. And you can take those tiles as they come, be in the moment, take these moments of uncertainty as a gift almost, because the rules can all change. And it, you could be out in front of that if you stay in the moment and have those core values. Um, well, Jeff, this has been really, really insightful on a lot of fronts from personal, professional, the business, the organizational things. And so I've found it very refreshing and gotten a lot out of it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's absolutely. My pleasure. It's, uh, it is always, Andy, a pleasure just to have a conversation with you. So I enjoyed it very much. And hopefully there are a few things in here that people find helpful. A hundred percent. There will be. We'll see you soon. Take okay. Care. Thanks thank very you. much. Take care. That was an inspiring conversation with Jeff Swearingen. Jeff's 25 years of experience at PepsiCo have given him wisdom that serves him well in this complex space of customer experience. In this episode, Jeff shared with us his insights around the customer experience space and the necessity for having the right mindset and being driven by pure customer delight. He also spoke about operating like a startup, the role of employee experience, customer humanity, and importantly, following your true north. Thank you, Jeff. That's it for this episode of It's a Customer's World. If you found this helpful and entertaining, I would be so grateful if you could share our show with your friends. And I'd be super happy if you subscribe so you can be updated as we publish new episodes. And if you really wanna help, leave us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. It's a Customer's World podcast as a product of the University of Arkansas Customer-Centric Leadership Initiative and a Walton College original production.